Hello everyone, today I'm with Glenn Slater and Glenn has taught for over two decades at Pacifica Graduate Institute where he currently chairs the Jungian and Archetypal Psychology Program. He's written articles and books and chapters for Jungian publications, edited the third volume of James Hillman's Uniform Edition, Senex and Career, and co-edited the essay collection, Varieties of Mythic Experience. His research and writing interests concern Jung and the psychology uh, of religion and depth psychology and technology. His book on Jung and post-humanism will be published in the fall 2023. So welcome, Glenn. Yeah, thank you. Good to be with you. Glenn, you wrote something. This is from the beginning of St. X and Pur, Pur, which I hope we can touch on a little later. But I've always liked this. Uh, to me, it describes James Hillman really well. James Hillman undoes. You enter his writing and a conversation or an argument will occur, either with him or with yourself or with some well-worn belief system. Favourite theories will be turned on their head or you'll be guarding them even closer. Hillman lifts rocks and reveals the strange creatures beneath. He locates fissures of narrow-mindedness and drops into their blind spaces, unravelling conventional wisdom and codified understanding. He makes new room for being psychological. The undoing always becomes an opening. The result is a different perspective, one that deepens before it explains. The consistent goal to put psych, soul, back into psychology. That reminds me of James Hillman. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so Glenn, we were going to take up a, a couple of topics today, uh, from Jung to Hillman, and then touch a little on the Sanx and Pur, and then uh, maybe talk about some of the orthodox uh, Jungian critique of Hillman. So, can mm -hmm. I hand it up? Can I hand it over to you for a little while? Okay. <laughs> just dive in and um, <clears throat> you can uh, let me know if I'm on track or not. <laughs> and likewise. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, I, I find myself uh, going backwards and forwards between Jung and Hillman. I, I teach classes uh, in both classical Jungian psychology and, and in the sort of branch uh, of psychology that Hillman uh, initiated, archetypal psychology. And um, I'm quite easy with that because I, I, I think that um, Hillman is certainly grounded in Jung and, and brings a kind of radical emphasis to things that are already in Jung. Um, and he does uh, then uh, go off in his own way and, and more so his own style. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important for, you know, uh, people to know and for critics to remember that he spent a decade totally steeped in that Zurich world of Jungian analysis and he was appointed the first director of studies at the sort of newly burgeoning Jung Institute <clears throat> um, and he knew you know Jung's work I would I would argue as well as anyone yeah. um, and so his pivots away don't come out of a sort of superficial you know, superficially reactionary position. And, and I think they do draw on his pre-Jungian work in literature. You know, he, he did a degree at uh, Trinity College in Dublin. Um, and, you know, he was alive for a short while when Jung was there and he talks in interviews about somewhat avoiding Jung, being a little afraid of getting into that coldish atmosphere that was 
around Jung in the last years before he died, but, but he met with Jung. They developed the curriculum for the Jung Institute together. Um, do, do and you he, do you, just for one second, Glenn, do you think he's yep. a bit of an outsider in his own way? Hillman? Do you mean from the beginning? He's certainly become yeah. an outsider. <clears throat> just in the way that... Uh, I, I was just saying to you before we started, you, you know, uh, Hillman reminds me of Ivan Illich. Uh, mm. uh, what Ivan Illich was to Catholicism, Hillman is to Jungianism in a way. Like they're, they're, part, they're steeped in it, but they've always got that kind of independent thinking. They want to stand outside a little and, you know, uh, give a few critiques here and there. I, and I think that that's a big part of Hillman's character that he's yeah. always done things a little differently. Um, you know, he, he comes into Jungian psychology from this literary background. He once aspired to be a novelist. Um, and you can see in his writing that that, that sort of emphasis on the, the poetics, the metaphorical richness is, is, uh, is still there. Um, yeah. And so even as he embraces the Jungian world in those first 10 years, um, there's a sort of fresh edge to him. And so by the time we get to the late 60s, um, he's already got some slightly different ideas. You know, one of my favorite books is The Myth of Analysis, and that's really written on the cusp of you know, it comes before revisioning psychology and it's written on the cusp of Hillman kind of breaking out into a slightly new direction. And um, so he he's he's both got one foot in the Jungian world and, and some other ideas about, um, you know, what the opus should be. I think that there you see the beginnings of this idea of soul making as he, as he calls it as a, a sort of alternate goal rather than the individuation that, that Jung and Jungians talk about. Um, mm. And also, you know, in that book, there's a wonderful little subsection um, called Towards an Imaginal Ego. And there he makes the argument that that you know what is it that Jungian psychology is trying to do? Well, it's it's trying to help a person live what's sometimes called the symbolic life, mm. that the ability to look at events, you know, rather than uh, whether they're inner or outer, and bring an imaginative sort of symbolic consciousness to that. Um, because that that's what keeps the door open to the unconscious, to to these messages that are kind of coming from below. So I like that idea myself. You know, it's it, not yeah. long after that he stops talking about the ego altogether. But but here he's talking about a certain style um, that is in keeping with the the goal of the Jungian work, as it were. Mm. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, getting back to what, uh, you know, the quote I read that you, that you wrote right at the beginning, it's kind of like his style, I don't know whether you'd call it, uh, somewhere you said he was um, uh, Aries-fueled and, and pure-driven. <laughs> but... What I like is, I mean, put it in, you know, simple terms. If if you've come through Jung and you think, you know, the self and the self and the centre go together, all of a sudden you read Myth of Analysis and then you think, oh, hang on, Hillman says, you know, it's good to be peculiar. The soul's peculiar. He, he goes away and, and makes you think in a different way or he says something about being eccentric, a little off-centre or, or, you know, he comes in and undoes your... What is it? Your your conventional Jungian wisdom, if you want to put it that way. 
I, th I think even in, in Jung, if we just stayed in Jungian psychology, because, you know, what we're talking about is sort of getting from Jung to Hellman. And um, how does the, the self, the archetype of the whole, actually show up in practice? And it, and it shows up, uh, it comes through these different configurations. It, it, it particularly shows up in the compensatory nature of how the unconscious comes into consciousness. So you pay attention to that symptom or that particular dream and the idea is that there's a, a kind of intelligence behind that that's aiming towards, uh, <clears throat> you know, br bringing your awareness to something that that uh, needs more development, that needs more attention. So in practice, um, it's not like that 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 image of the whole is always constellated. We go through life and we deal with this and uh, this particular problem or situation. And so I think a way to understand Hellman's more polytheistic emphasis is to think of it as a sort of serial monotheism that, that you attend to what the psyche is putting you know, on your plate. Um, and I often, you know, because he was, I was, uh, you know, gifted to be able to be in many seminars with him and even share some classes at Pacifica. And this question would always come up about Jung and the self. And in the early days, he'd just get kind of angry and <laughs> Push, push it off. In fact, that happened to me the very first time that uh, I heard him lecture. But particularly after he wrote The Soul's Code and started talking about the idea of deeper character and the daemon and so forth, um, he couldn't help but entertain questions. Well, you know, this sounds a little like the self. And he would say, if you imagine life as a string of pearls, I'm interested in the pearls, not the string. And I have a feeling if you pay attention to the pearls, the string takes care of itself. And I, I, I like that um, kind of uh, uh, anecdote that, that, um, that there's always a hidden monotheism in any kind of polytheistic system. Yeah. And that even when you dig in uh, into a monotheistic system, whether it's religion or something else, you're going to find a kind of polytheism. You know, in Christianity, you have the intercessionary powers, the saints, and so forth. So, so, so the the God capital G might be the end game, but how you actually make your way to God has to do with all these particularities. So I, I think this um, this sort of push away from the self, even though Hillman underscores it at the beginning of re revisioning psychology, I think it's it's been hung onto as a bit of a dogma in some of the the critics, you know, and and so therefore you're taking this central piece of Jungian thought away. And it makes Hellman automatically a, a rebel or an outsider. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. And one way I would take what you were just saying is <clears throat> as he looks into the different gods and goddesses, you know, he, he likes to, when, when you're talking about the imagination of Hellman, he seems to like to bring out each of their imagination. Like he doesn't like the ones that have been repressed. If, if Dionysus has been repressed by Apollo, he's going to go in and fight for, uh, you know, the Dionysian, if we could put it that way. Yeah, he, he to me, he's a very keen observer of the culture and, um, you know, what, what was sort of dominant in the sphere of uh, consciousness and people's preoccupations and, and so that gave him a nose then for what was displaced archetypally, you know, 
And of course, the gods being personifications of the archetypes. Um, if, for example, you know, as we've seen, um, uh, reason seems to have kind of gone out the door in many ways, in many quarters of the cultural discussion, then, you know, you go against the grain and you start talking about the importance of Apollo. You know, even though, in a sense, the modern world has been dominated by Apollo and Jung saw rationalism as a kind of great enemy to the ability to relate to the unconscious. Um, so this this kind of goes to Hillman's style. You, you know, um, he revived the term soul, but then by the time we got into the mid-90s, and Moore wrote Care of the Soul and a couple of sequences and everyone is talking about soul and you'd open the newspaper and cars now had soul. And, <laughs> um, and, and, and I remember him even going through a phase where he said, let's just put that term aside and use yeah. another term. Yeah. And um, so, but if we step back into the big picture, I think he did give a lot of play to those divinities in the Greek pantheon that our uh, Judaic and Christian imagination tended to push away, like Dionysus, um, like uh, Hermes. Um, you know, the, the, there's no tricksterish figure as such i mean satan often uh, the devil yeah. plays like a trickster but we in the mainstream christian imagination we don't we don't see that figure so much as a, a trickster but a personification of of evil so are there, there are these patterns that are repressed mm -hmm. in our habitual you know, Western Christianized consciousness that that in a way color the unconscious, um, and even even Aphrodite Venus, you know, Aphrodite beauty, mm. another very good example. Um, you know, uh, Pan, um, the the god of nature, who was turned into in many respects the the Christian the Christian devil. So. So, you know, the idea is to develop a psychology that can embrace these particular uh, patterns and um, styles of consciousness. You know, it's something Hillman would always say in terms of, well, what is a god? And um, that is a style of consciousness, a, 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 a mode of imagination. And a taste, you know, a certain taste of how taste. one is, is engaging with things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a sensitivity, um, and uh, you know, the the gods also can be thought of as values. So, so you develop a sense of a certain value, the importance of the aesthetic um in the way you live or the importance of not just making room for nature but but making room for the wild side of nature the unpredictable mm -hmm. dimension which you know pan represents um so you're right it, yeah a certain kind of taste different taste mm -hmm. and I, I also like glenn you know you in your article uh, between Jung and Hillman, the idea of Jung as the father in Zurich and Hillman as the the son, the the somewhat restless son who kind of, in in my imagination, lobbed up in Dallas, you know, might have lived next to J.R. Ewing or whatever his name was, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that kind of uh, son who didn't just follow in the footsteps of the father, but entered into the vision. I, I thought that was really, I like that. 
Yeah, he, he um, I mean, he himself refers to Jung as the first father of archetypal psychology. And, um, and he's talking mainly about the stream of ideas, of course. Um, but I do think it was Hillman's own sense of calling in a way to um, take things in his own direction. And I, I you know, as Jung is uh, quoted as saying that he preferred to be Jung and not a Jungian. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I think that the spirit, you know, whether yeah. Jung would have gone along with a lot of the moves that Hillman made, I'm not sure, but, this, but the underlying spirit of taking the work and developing it in your own way, mm -hmm. I think is very much in keeping with what, what he was, uh, what yeah. he was up to. I read a quote the other day on Facebook that said, and the end of it by Jung was, the idea is not to turn people into sheep, but sheep into people. And I was thinking, <laughs> well, if you if you read Hillman for long enough, you, you know, it's just about impossible to remain uh, the sheep in a way because of the because of all the moves he makes. Well, I think the thing is that if you if you can see the gods at work. If you if you develop an eye for the archetypal world, that is what protects you from being a sheep, because that allows you then to see through, like where these energies are, are kind of arising and then likely to grab you unconsciously by by the back of the neck, um, and he talks about this. I, I think so well at the in the final part of revisioning psychology, where he's describing the way psychology and religion could, in a way, offset each other. That that um, it, you know, and he's talking about religion in the Jungian way of religion being, as Jung said, paying careful attention to the forces that impinge upon us to have a religious attitude going back to that um, etymological root of religion, uh, you know, religio, to, to kind of uh, look again, to, to pay careful uh, consideration. And that if that becomes a practice, then you're apt to be savvy to where there's a kind of cultishness appearing or a sort of dogmatism or people asking for initiations and sacrifices and because because these dynamics are also archetypal you know these these yeah. processes and that they're always going to be there just because we're not overtly religious doesn't mean that those <clears throat> archetypal processes that have traditionally shown up in religion and not going to then show up elsewhere. So so back to the to the key point, the more familiar you are, the more tools you have in your kind of archetypal toolbox, yeah. the more gods you can recognize, then the the better off you are in terms of not sort of being duped into some um, <clears throat> yeah. Singularity of all. Inflation, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Well, Glenn, I wonder whether we can move now to the Senex and Pua. Uh, you, you wrote the introduction to the Uniform Edition, and yeah. I was thinking, well, you've had a long time to think about it now. And, <laughs> uh, uh, but it seems to me that, okay, we, if someone reads a little Hillman, right, okay, we talk about Apollo, we talk about Hermes, uh, you know, we, we might have got on to Artemis as a style or or whatever, but Senex and Pua, they're not, you know, not gods and goddesses, but it's a pattern, right? But it's nevertheless a very powerful pattern that's in operation. 
within our lives. And it seems to me it's such a really big part of Hillman's work. Um, you know, he devoted a lot of time to that topic. So I wondered, what have you been thinking about it lately? <laughs> what, 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 what does it mean to you, basically? That word. Um, it, 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 it means a lot. Um, I, I know we're going to leave the technology conversation for another time, perhaps, but of course, that's also what's in the air. And um, a user-friendly way to think about, you know, Puer, of course, means young man, Senex, old man. Um, so these are personified figures um, using the Latin terms. But the easiest way to think about them is just old and new. And so we we live in an age where the new is where the numinosity is uh it, you know new innovation <clears throat> new technology having the latest device um it goes to the consumer society of having you know <clears throat> the new car or or whatever it is and so I think we're in a time where we need to find ways to reconnect with the old, which, you know, if you're a, a, a Jungian, um, the old never goes away because the archetypes are always there. Um, so, you know, what, what Hellman did with this pattern was to argue that um, they are two sides of the one archetypal configuration and that they tend to become split and polarized. Um, and so one side will go off into the unconscious and then manifest some, somewhat uh, symptomatically and so forth. So so you can you can like look at the cult of the new if you will but underneath that you're always going to find uh, some sort of unconscious um rigidity for example you know tightness around money um you know a, a sense of uh fixity um or we want to bring in contemporary politics, you know, um, authority and authoritarianism. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, just, just Go just ahead. One thing, sorry, one thing I didn't understand there, Glenn, is are you talking about authoritarianism on the side of the Pu'er, on the side of the new? Or... No, on the side of the Senex. Oh, okay. So in other words, the, 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 the Senex piece can very often fall into the unconscious side, I think, because of this, you know, <clears throat> newfangled digital age where everything seems fresh, where there's all kinds of, you know, opportunities and possibilities and you can remake your online image and you can be an avatar. And these, these are all very kind of poor things. Yeah. And with a that, seductive charm. Like yes, to, uh, you know. exactly. Bernie Neville wrote a very good article uh, on this back, going back uh, a good few years now. Um, yeah. That the internet is is very much a Hermes realm, and and Hermes is an example of a of a Puer type figure. But then, what arises in compensation, you know, in terms of um politics is this emergence of a kind of regressive yeah. movement you know a, a, a reaching back for the past in a kind of traditionalistic way or a you it's know a fundamentalist religious style kind of a way but it's, it's complicated isn't it because when i read Jung, i get this yeah. whole sense of the archaic and the so-called primitive and 
and even the religious experiences is, is connected to that. But it's, I would call it the deep past, you know, the, the, the kind of going way back into the deep past and myth as the beginning, you know, and all of that. Whereas, as you're saying, where it often seems to play out is just this aggressiveness around, hey, you know, uh, we need to come down on law and order. Um, you know, there's crime and then, the, you know, it, it's kind of this kind of, um, I don't know, just uh, going back 50 years or something is what people mm -hmm. want to do, you know, into a time which was a bit simpler. Well, I, you know, knowing I was going to talk to you today, I was thinking about the difference in a sort of Australian and American culture around this pattern. And yeah. uh, they do tend to get polarised at the cultural level. But I would say in Australia, they're less polarised um, than they are in the US. I mean, the US is a very poor culture, very, very obsessed with with youth and it it kind of comes from its origins as a frontier nation you know it's it was the new world yeah um there's a term term new again but everyone seems to be on the move reinventing themselves the land of opportunity and so forth um but then it has this kind of fierce traditionalism and conservatism that that can then come back in these ways whereas i think australia has a very healthy kind of bullshit detector when it comes to anything that gets too sort of rigid sort of stick in the mud uh, i don't think australians would put up with a trump for example they they tend to see through someone like like uh, Trump as being a bit of a wanker, as <laughs> you yeah. might say, yeah. um, and and then but then the poor side in the Australian side is that capacity to play, you know, to have to have leisure to I think think very differently. I'm always surprised when I go back at like uh, some of the inventiveness around food and architecture and all sorts of interesting things going yeah. on. I, um, you know, you know what I get, Glenn, is that, you know, and again, this is like, okay, go on to Facebook, and I have lots of friends from the US on Facebook, but yeah, and you, it seems to me in the US, you're either a Democrat or a Republican, and you, I don't know, maybe there's three people in the US that aren't Democrat or Republican. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it's it's like polarized, and. Mm -hmm. They're both spewing out a bit of pop propaganda, if you ask me, but it's like it, it's fully polarised. Whereas maybe, I don't know, be, maybe because of the Irish migration in Australia and the convicts and stuff like that, it's, people aren't don't believe in the government that much to start with. They'd rather do a right. bit of the play. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, yes. Not as, it's not as earnest, if I could put it that way. It's playing out, but it's not quite. Well, it's not as earnest, but I think the blessing in Australia is that the 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 difference between the left and right side of your national politics is not so great, you know. Whereas in the U.S., it's it's become kind of a chasm, um, and you know, as you say, yeah, there's there's tricky business on on both on both sides for sure but but here's a twist that that you know hillman pointed out to me early on um, when i was writing a little bit about this pure senex thing and its relationship to archetypal psychology is that the the polarization itself belongs to the negative senex that that um that sort of division that that kind of clearing you know uh, both sides and and the clarity that comes from that uh that's a that's a kind of negative senex thing whereas the positive senex is like the generosity of wisdom for example yeah. the 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 mentoring that can come from the old 
from the old hand. The, or, the or way the elder, and, the elder, the, sorry? The, the elder that hands down stories from the past and myths. Exactly. The, and the way that the conservatism conserves and preserves what's what's important, what's valuable, the sort of underlying structure. So it doesn't become a, a kind of uh, rigidity or a power grab. It, it, it's more of a, a kind of enlivening from below. Um, or an honoring of the ancestors in, in, in some other language. Well, I think that's a beautiful phrase for this. The honoring of the ancestors would be a way to, you know, uh, relate to that Senex side. Mm. And so the aim in Hellman is to bring the two together. And he actually uses the phrase in these, these early essays, the union of sames, yeah. that this, this would be the Senex and Puer. Um, and it can be the Puer moving towards the Senex. So, for example, the way in which the that sort of <clears throat> movement and imaginative flair of the Puer becomes like it's brought down into a, into a, an opus, uh, a, a, a piece of work, uh, a kind of discipline in the creative process. Gets or it could feet, be the other way feet. around. Gets Sorry, its feet, it gets its feet on the ground for the for well the, feet on feet on the psychic ground, yeah. yeah and yeah. sometimes the puer personality needs to kind of come back to reality. That's true, but as but as Hillman said, it's not it's not so much the return to Mother Earth as it as it is the the realization, you know, the 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 bringing out of the the work, the fruitifying of the calling and so forth. Um, and, and the other way around, you know, with the, we've all known those wonderful elders who have a twinkle in their eye. Yeah. You know, the playfulness doesn't it, go away. Or the 90-year-old that takes up tennis. We like them. We like those <laughs> people with a, a little adventurous spirit. You know? Yes, a vitality, and uh, you know. So there's there's the Senex and Pue, you know. The, the 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 and so the idea here is that it's 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 like you want one side to modify the other, mm. so that that polarization doesn't occur, um, and you get it. You get a kind of warming or or a dance between. Yeah. The, the the two sides and and one could say that that Hellman's whole psychology is like this if you read it carefully there is this uh puer um uh dexterity this the fluidity the 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 metaphors and the, the images that he's there's a liveliness about his writing but it's built upon very deep foundations, you know. And he and he, I got he into it. As, he has footnotes. He has footnotes. And and he pointed that out to me when I wrote something about maybe archetypal psychology was a bit too much on the side of the Pu'er and some of its adherents were going here, there and everywhere. And he said, he used the word heavy artillery. If you look at my early books, there's all this heavy artillery in the footnotes. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's true, particularly of myth of analysis and revisioning psychology. And, and if anyone can brave it, his first book, Emotion, is, it's an encyclopedia. It's, a, it's really an encyclopedic study of theories of emotion. So, so that Senex piece is, is well and truly there which also I think some of his critics, including David Tacey, uh, tend yeah. to overlook. You know, I, I remember reading in Hillman somewhere where he said, you know, like it, it's a complicated topic, isn't it? But he, he said something along the line, you get touch, you get burnt when you try to touch it, Senex and Pua, you know, but it's like, but, but nevertheless, the exploration of this topic is the most valuable thing to do and I, I found that personally like it, it's it's fruitful it's a it, it's a really good thing to study in a way yes 
I think so. I, I, I think to bring awareness to where those old and new proclivities are, are playing out and are they playing out consciously or are they playing, playing out, out unconscious? Yeah, that's the thing. And yeah. uh, one other thing I'd, I'd mention, um, Glenn, is like, it seems to me Hillman started writing about the, the poor in the 60s, right? And, you know, okay, we can say John Lennon and Jimi Hendrix and all of that. Were, were were classics <laughs> and timothy leary by the way who was a historical towards the past but then it kind of to me it morphed into like some of the new age and spiritual groups in the 70s and 80s but now and this relates to your book silicon valley became a home of the poor's and and elon musk let's go and live on mars um, so I lost you there for a little bit, John, when you were talking about John Lennon and then it went, uh, went I, I lost you. I, I sometimes think about the way it's morphed over the last 50, 60 years. So, okay, the, the long-haired 60s youth was the poor in action, let's say, yep. in simple terms. And then we had the new age and, and lots of Westerners heading off to India, transcendental meditation. and So there was another manifestation and then because i was involved in organizational change i always think of that was another area you know like they all went into organizational change but now all the poors are in silicon valley that's their congregational <laughs> church or whatever and elon musk is the king of the poors because he's saying you know we're, we're going to go and live on mars we're, we're going to leave this world actually yeah and go and live on another one yeah, I I think taking this pattern to Silicon Valley is uh, uh, it's like a um, a target rich field, <laughs> and um, so you you know you've got you've got the vision and you've got those sort of great entrepreneurial stories and you also have genuine brilliance and and intelligence and innovation and so forth. Yeah, but the the Senex side would be the technocracy that's that's emerging, and the, you know, what what uh, Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism, um, the attention economy, uh, all of these kind of shadow sides of the of the um, flare of the of the digital world, the, the kind of corporate. Um, monster mm. that comes in behind the innovation. That's that's the sort of negative Senex that's mm. that's churning away in the background. And to put it another way, the poor like to deepen into the like it's like when you see the everyone's portraits now that they're putting up of uh, the the AI portraits. The I don't know whether you've seen them, but. The kind of soullessness it's like the, the you know as as like it's seductive to many people but it's kind of like that deepening into the psyche and the soul that's kind of uh missing if you want to put it that way with the brilliance of the of, of the ai portraits well you know the if you watch carefully the what jung would call the unconscious and um uh, you know hillman might call the 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 sort of neglected god they're always coming in somewhere and i think that that's the the brilliance of the jungian world in a way is to be able to show us how these archetypes or gods as jung said come back as symptom and not just to wreak havoc, which they sometimes do, but to then give us an opportunity to become more conscious, to wake up to, you know, what we're not um, giving enough play to, mm. um, what, what really needs more attention. So, you know, some people get a little uh, miffed at the way Hillman particularly after revisioning psychology, he doesn't really talk about the unconscious anymore. 
but for him the unconscious is is the presence of the past within us the the world of memoria as he calls it the the the, the gods are always with us if if we are aware of them um so so his psychology i think we might say focuses on that threshold, that imaginative threshold between what Jungians call the conscious and unconscious, where the images, the dreams, um, the fantasies, the where where these things begin to emerge, mm -hmm. where they start to push into our awareness. Yeah, that's good. Well, I wonder whether we could go on to this last section in terms of the orthodox critique of Hillman. You know, I, mean, I think maybe you, you've touched upon it in one way or another through the through the conversation, anyway. But in particular, I suppose um, uh, uh, David Tacey uh, wrote an article about uh, Hillman, which um, I, I mean, this is just my impression. I know David Tacey, and I really love Edge of the Sacred, and I've admired a lot of the things that he's um, written. I feel his essay on Hillman or his critique was a little bit too strong for me, personally. But um, the one in the Journal of Analytical Psychology. Yeah. Yes, and uh, you know, it attacked. I mean, Jeanette, I, I think I said to you before, but Jeanette Perry said it's a, it's like a moral condemnation in a way. It, it to me, it kind of entered into that territory, and I was thinking, like I think of David Casey. Um, Hillman was his uh, analyst, um, so it's kind of like Hillman the father, and you know that, and then Tacey's the son. And he kind of wants to surpass the the father, so he's it is a bit eatable, you know. He's having a go at the father um, along the way, but you know that's just my street language for it. What do you think? And how does it fit to the to the you know orthodox critique of Hillman? Well, you know, I, I I also know David, and I've had talked to him a little bit about this, although it was before these pieces came out. Um, it was uh, after I wrote that piece between Jung and Hillman. Um, but David had written an earlier uh, essay um, back in 98 called Twisting and Turning with the World of James Hillman, and it was there that he more or less revealed doing this analysis that he he <clears throat> he was in Dallas for a year or two and um with the purpose of studying with Hellman. And I think you know, I, I'm not sure about the, the father-son dynamic, although there's certainly a kind of old man, young man uh piece there. But I think when you read that article and you put it together with what he does in the Journal of Analytical Psychology, what you get is a profound disillusionment. And it's very specific because David says that, you know, he really had hopes that Hillman would bring the world of Jungian psychology into the academy. And that I think was David's project that that he you know as he talks about their psychology had rejected the world of depth psychology and he wanted through literary studies to be able to bring back in these depth psychological understandings and I think he felt like Hillman kind of abandoned uh, him in a way and and um, abandoned that that possibility. So there's this kind of bitterness um, and disappointment. You know, and to David's credit, he says at the beginning of those two journal of analytical psychology pieces that he doesn't expect to... Um, for people to think he's being objective. <laughs> and uh, I don't think he is, is being objective. Um, but I, I, I feel like the, the orthodox critique of Hillman 
revolves around one we've already mentioned his seeming rejection of the archetype of the self yeah. and therefore the more <laughs> monotheistic um, structure in in Jungian psychology but what goes along with that is a sort of push away from Christianity and a particularly a fierce critique of Christianity um, but there's nuance to these things. And, you know, there's a very revealing chapter in the book Interviews um, where Hillman is supposedly talking to this Italian journalist. And, and there's a chapter called A Running Engagement with Christianity. Mm. And uh, Laura Pozzo. I, sorry? Laura Pozzo. Yes, exactly. Is she a real um, that, person? Well, that, that was, that's always been a kind of discussion. Did this person exist or did Ilman kind of right. invent her for the sake of uh, <clears throat> answering his own questions? I, <clears throat> I, I don't know that. But, hmm. but it's, a, it's a more personal you know, description of, of what's going on there. And I, I heard Ilman once in a seminar do a commentary on this. And, and what he said is, I'm not against Christianity. And he, he, he actually made the point of what a rich tradition it was. He, Hillman actually went to a Jesuit college um, in Washington. That was the first part of his university training and studied the works of the church fathers and so forth. He says, what I'm against is unconscious Christianity the way in which these unconscious ideas about, you know, resurrection, for example, and always reaching for the light and the idea that the underworld is ruled by Satan and, and you know, nature is in the hands of the devil and all, all of these sort of things that creep into consciousness, even if we're not overtly Christian. They've been, they've been strong you know, within our culture and, and, and have created a certain kind of dominance, whether we happen to be Christian or, or not Christian practicing. Exactly. And, 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 and so his contention is that that was the main thing. And again, it's a matter of trying to be more, more conscious. Um, but the other thing, and perhaps the main thing about Christianity that's problematic for Hillman is its literalism. That, that Christianity takes its mythology and sees it as history, you know, that, that the Jesus of the gospel is the same thing as the historical Jesus. Now, I know sophisticated theologians don't think yeah. that way, but the masses of particularly of fundamentalist Christianity or ultra conservative Catholicism and so forth, there's there's no differentiation between between the myth and the and the image um, and the the literal interpretation of the image. So I I think it's it's a sort of style of being religious that is really the the problem here and the, the monotheistic piece relates to that which is there's just one truth there's just there's just one god everything comes back everything comes back to this and and to put it in a kind of a blunt way is that that some of that and i know hillman talks about the puritanism at the beginning of the new world sometimes and he has a bit of a right. go at puritanism but sometimes i think people carry like they'll carry that on to Jung or into the Jung world so that, you know, there can be that monotheism or the one truth or like Jung didn't follow Freud, right? Because he, he said that psychology is a subjective confession. So why would people expect Hillman to walk in his footsteps 100%? But there's that kind of, uh, there's that kind of carrying of the literalism of Christianity into the, into the young world i don't know does that make sense that's how i see it sometimes yeah and 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 then you get the sort of dogmatic style that you can't play with ideas that you can't interpret 
things differently, that there's, there's not um, uh, deeper ways to work through a, a particular image or certain kinds of meaning. Um, so, you know, I, I think something I haven't mentioned that I think is very important to understand Hillman is that he said that what he was doing was a therapy of ideas. Uh, or sometimes he calls it a psychology of psychology. And so if your home base is Jung and you want to walk your talk, if that's what you're doing, then you're trying to do a therapy of Jungian ideas too, to sort of see through them to their mythic archetypal background and substructure. That yeah. doesn't mean you have to throw them out. I actually have no problem with the idea of the self. But I do have a problem if the self sort of dominates to the point where the specificity of other dimensions of the psyche get kind of overlooked or displaced. And, and the soul, me, soul reminds me. I, I always like when Thomas More talks about the soul. Like sometimes I, I've got some of his things on Audible and I find them very comforting, especially if I'm a bit stressed out or something like that, because the soul reminds me of something religious. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the soul's got a religious dimension, and um, that's old and, yes. and somehow beautiful and archaic. And, and so it's just another way of looking at things, you know, and, but it's very open. Yeah, and, and uh, I think the link there might be the idea of the way that soul is larger than life. You know, so it it can't be confined to the personal. It it can't even in our imagination be confined to this particular life because we have these ideas about coming into the world with some sort of seed of character or or gift or calling and and that that you know when we leave this world something gets left behind some something lingers um how you understand or imagine that differs but nonetheless that's part of how we how we think of soul and soul as we were talking about before seems to be religious in the sense of it it asks us to pay attention to what is deep and yeah. to the to the world of the spirits the ancestors the gods the the things that are working on our life but are beyond our, our life. And so Hellman's idea of soul making is to try to cultivate those sorts of ideas and perspectives so that that quality of consciousness is present to us. Mm. No, and then, then we live differently. Mm. Um, we live with a sense of depth and, and meaning and um you know e events and not just concrete events but also symbolic actions and uh um there's a richness and i i think that that's that's what he was out for and and how how it all added up or kind of you know integrated into a balanced personality was something secondary for him so it is a, it's a, it's a different it's a different kind of emphasis. Um, but I don't think you can embrace what Hillman has to say and still have a healthy relationship to ideas like ego self relation and so forth. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm a living example of someone who came through Hillman to Jung. I gained my initial appreciation for Jung from Hillman. Ah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So that just goes yeah. to show that uh, there's probably quite a few people like that. You know, it was first the myth of analysis, which I came across, and then he turned me on to, to you know, Jungian thinking. So yeah. one can love Jung and love Hillman at the same time, if you ask me. Very yeah, I, I do. And, and um, the other thing, though, you know, just so I can squeeze it in here is... Um, a big mistake that that 
a lot of Jungians make when they look at Hillman's work is to try to read him like they, in the same way they read Jung, in the sense of Jung's psychology being about the structure and dynamics of the psyche. You know, that the Jung has all these ways of talking about the psyche where it's like he's doing archaeology. He's He's yeah. peeling off the layers and saying, well, this is what lives at this depth. And, and these dynamics kind of come up and shape the contents of consciousness. You know, the complex as an archetypal core, and we can even draw diagrams and map this out. Yeah. Hillman, Hillman's is a psychology of perspective. He, he's interested in the way we're seeing things the way we're imagining into things, which includes the way we're theorizing, Um, you know, and and he could sometimes irreverently refer to that psychodynamic as kind of the plumbing model of the the psyche. But but you, you have to be able to make that shift to read Hillman to realize that what he's working on is the the field that we're in when we approach a topic, when we approach an event, yeah. um, when we, we're holding a dream or we're holding a symptom, what is the, the most fruitful attitudinal posture? What is, what is the most um, uh, uh, you know, engaging and, and um, enlivening way to kind of imagine that? What, what brings soul? in other words. Um, so it's all about the glasses that that you're wearing, um, even when you're doing psychology, that, so that the ideas of psychology also start to be seen as, well, that's, what, that's a way of looking at this. Yeah. Uh, instead of, you know, the um, making the mistake that the, you know, you're, uh, you're looking at the moon, but you're actually looking at the finger that's pointing to the moon. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I imagine this is something you struggle every day in, you know, <clears throat> honoring you at Pacifica Graduate Institute, honoring you, honoring Hillman, and, um, and the learnings and wisdom of both. Yeah, like, you know, I I may do most of my teaching in the Jungian Archetypal Studies program, and um, that's the perspective that we encourage. It's mainly uh, Jungian, but we, we have a healthy appreciation for Hillman's work and can kind of bring him in and hold the two. And you know, all the students have different proclivities and sensibilities. You know, they all end up, some people just become very enamored with Hillman and, and you know, he's he's their man. Other people come out of exactly the same program, exactly the same classes, and they're more in that kind of classical mold. So it, it you know, it depends on people's own sensibilities as as well it does. There, there but, but but one thing i appreciate i, I was talking to uh saffron rossi who yep. you happen to be married to and yes. the, the thing that struck me when i was speaking with, with her was um there hasn't been a pacifica graduate institute in australia for a start because when i did psychology it was all rats and stats at the uwa and skinner mm. who i can't bear to think about anymore <laughs> and um but the interdisciplinary like that's what I like about Pacific the the because to me that brings a kind of a breadth or something. It's like you know, with those people that have come through literary studies and those people that have come through a, a phenomenology or something or come it, it it's like they bring different styles too, don't they, to it? And and I like that. Yeah, and that's been true of Jungian psychology. I think it's more true of the people that gathered around Hillman coming from multiple perspectives, you know, only some being Jungian analysts, other people coming from communications or the arts, um, you know, from religious studies. Um, So 
Um, and it is also much more a psychology of culture. This is one thing I think I think David gets wrong in his early article where he divides Hillman's career up into these four phases. And, you know, the third phase is suddenly where Hillman becomes interested in what's going on in the world and, you know, his essay on the anima mundi and so forth. But but he begins his magnum opus revisioning psychology with the statement that he wants to take psychology out of the clinical room. He he defines soul there as what happens between us and events. Um, soul is not an interiorized thing at all. That's part of the reimagining. So I, I think there's a lot more continuity around that. But the point is that Hellman's, Hellman's psychology, even more so than Jung's, is very much eyeing what goes on culturally. And so the interdisciplinary um, working of, of these ideas, I, I think, becomes very, very important. Um, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks very much, Glenn. I really, I, I'm just uh, looking towards our time there. Is there something you want to say about your book before we go that's coming out? Can you tell us the guts of it? <laughs> well, I, I've been for many years interested in the relationship between psychology and technology. And yeah. um, what has occupied me as I've been writing this book, which has been uh, quite a while now, uh, is the theme of post-humanism. The, the idea that we're moving towards a kind of marriage with the machine, um, an integration of computer that, that our brains will have interfaces with AI and that we'll be kind of living half online and half half offline or and what have you. And so I I'm very interested in the fantasy of that and what seems to be driving it on the one hand. And also the psychological effects of digital technology that we're already experiencing. And so the book is a sort of examination of those two strands from a from a Jungian perspective. And um I'm putting forward the point of view that whereas the industrial revolution sort of disrupted our outer ecology, the post-industrial world is disrupting our inner ecology. Yeah. And that this is going to be the, you know, the the uh, the tricky territory of the 23rd century is is how um this this getting closer and closer in our daily lives and maybe even our physical lives to um you know the the virtuality um yeah. like what is that going to do to the psyche and uh will will we be able to maintain enough of a kind of root system in what we think of in Jungian psychology as the the archetypal world um, to even, you know, have the kind of uh, psychological regulatory system that we take for granted in many ways. Um, so, yeah, it's all about those things. <clears throat> Well, thank you, and thank you for <clears throat> sharing so much and sure. uh, about your thinking over a long period of time about all of these things. Thanks very much. Good, good, good to talk with you, John.